Hello, and welcome to everyone. I'm uh, John Baer, President and CEO of the Midwest ISO. And I'd like to thank the committee, first and foremost, for selecting us. We view it as quite an honor uh, to be included in the finalist group, so thank you very much. Today, we're going to demonstrate how the Midwest ISO used operations research to introduce centralized energy and ancillary service markets. My organization exists to create greater efficiencies of the transportation and production of electricity. Let's take a look. Dozens of times each day, with a flick of a switch, each one of us taps into vast sources of energy, deep veins of coal, and great reservoirs of oil, sweeping winds, and rushing waters, the hidden power of the atom, and the radiance of the sun itself, all transformed into electricity, the workhorse of the modern world. Electricity impacts every aspect of our modern lives, our homes, our businesses, our cities, our economy. Without it, we wouldn't be able to use our computers, watch television, talk on the phone, or even turn on our lights, and yet we take it for granted. What started in Thomas Edison's workshop in 1879 has grown to become a complex network of transmission lines, substations, and power plants that crisscrosses North America and has been dubbed by many as the most complex machine ever devised by man. In the central United States, Midwest ISO manages this superhighway of electricity. Thanks to our highly skilled engineers and their extensive use of operations research, we make sure that man's most complex machine works reliably, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, providing dependable energy to our member utilities and the customers that they serve. Midwest ISO is a nonprofit organization that serves the electrical energy needs of over 40 million end use customers. We do this by providing independent transmission system access, delivering improved reliability coordination through efficient market operations, coordinating regional planning, and fostering a platform for wholesale energy markets. Headquartered in Carmel, Indiana, with control centers in Carmel, Indiana and St. Paul, Minnesota, the Midwest ISO acts as an air traffic controller for the electric grid controlling nearly 60,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines and more than 1,000 power plants capable of generating more than 146 billion watts of electricity. This infrastructure spans 13 Midwestern states plus the Canadian province of Manitoba and is owned by more than 750 individual companies, each of whom have turned over operational control of their transmission and generation equipment to the Midwest ISO. Building the energy and ancillary services markets was complex enough. This complexity was further increased by the unique properties of electricity. The electricity that comes into our homes and businesses is a unique commodity in that the laws of physics require that it be consumed at the very instant it's generated. What this means for grid operators like Midwest ISO is that the electricity we consume every day must be generated at the instant and at the same magnitude that it is being consumed. Therefore, every time a light is turned on, a computer is powered down, or a compressor starts up, the output of a generator somewhere on the system must be adjusted to compensate. This delicate balance between total generation output and total load consumption must be constantly maintained. Any disruption to this balance can result in an interruption of service, up to and including a collapse of the entire electrical grid. By leveraging operations research, the Midwest ISO was able to overcome these challenges and provide significant value to the region. Before the Midwest ISO and the markets existed, each utility served their electric demand in their service territory with their own power plants. They used their own transmission lines to transport their electricity to their end-use customers and held enough capacity to manage their operational risk. This resulted in utilities optimizing the use of their own assets while carrying extra investment to manage their risk, often at the expense of the larger electrical system. 
And that worked, but it wasn't efficient, both in terms of the cost and the use of the transmission lines. To address these inefficiencies, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, through a series of landmark regulations, ordered open access to the transmission system and enabled broad wholesale power competition. The open access order required transmission owners to provide open, non-discriminatory access of their transmission systems to customers. Open access transmission was critical for the competition of wholesale electricity markets. These orders gave rise to the formation of regional transmission operators in the late 1990s. Regional transmission operators are known as RTOs, and the Midwest ISO became the first FERC-approved RTO. What happens when utility, a utility agrees to join the Midwest ISO? While the utility retains physical control of its power plants and transmission lines, it no longer has the functional control of its assets. The utility still operates its own power plants and transmission lines, but the Midwest ISO uses dispatch signals to tell the power plant when to produce energy and how much to produce. Additionally, the utility agrees to participate in the wholesale electricity market. It offers to supply energy or buy energy needed to meet its demand. What does the Midwest ISO do in return? The Midwest ISO manages the real-time balancing of energy supply and demand. It clears the supply offers and demand bids to manage reliability and maximize the total societal benefit. Through the use of operations research, we provide billions of dollars in value as a result of our wholesale energy markets. These markets allow the Midwest ISO to efficiently utilize grid infrastructure while improving the reliability of the system. Utilities capture this benefit, and that's why they join the Midwest ISO. Now, Richard Doing, who oversees all the Midwest ISO market operations, will provide you further detail on exactly how our markets work. Richard? Thank you, John. First, I'd like to give a little bit of context and background. The Midwest ISO implemented an energy-only market in April of 2005, and then we did it all over again, implementing an en energy and ancillary services market in 2009. We divided those markets into two distinct areas, tackling one at a time. We first focused on the energy-only market. The energy traded in this market is the energy that factories, businesses, and you and I consume every day. The goal of the energy market is to dispatch generation through market-based economic incentives while keeping the system reliable. To do this, we have two markets, a day-ahead and a real-time market. The Midwest ISO's day-ahead market enables utilities operating power plants to offer energy into the market based on their willingness, reflected in offers to sell, and ability to produce energy the following day. The day-ahead market is financially binding. This provides an incentive for power plants to perform as scheduled the next day. The day ahead market also allows power plant operators to plan for the next day, so the utilities know the amount of energy they have committed to generate. This is especially useful for large power plants that require advance notice to start operating. Because anticipated demand, available power plant capacity, and system conditions can change during the day, the Midwest ISO operates a real-time market. In the real-time market, we use technology to precisely analyze moment-to-moment -moment conditions. And based on this information, our operators balance demand and generation to keep the system reliable and economically efficient. A few years after we launched the energy-only market, we expanded the market to include ancillary services. And while the concept of energy is relatively easy to understand, Ancillary services are not as intuitive, so I'm going to explain what they are and how they work. The first ancillary service is regulation. Regulation has the main objective of keeping frequency on the grid at 60 hertz, constantly. Many of our appliances, machines, are engineered to run at 60 hertz. If the frequency dramatically changes, this equipment plugged into the grid can run unpredictably and even be damaged. Think about someone you know whose life depended on hospital equipment powered by electricity during a critical medical procedure. Or think about the internet that you use every day. 
Frequency is critical and kept constant by fine-tuning moment-to-moment changes that affect supply and demand. This is done through signals sent every four seconds to a pool of power plants providing regulation service. The second ancillary service is contingency reserves. Contingency reserves reflect a power plant capacity set aside to respond to major disruptions, such as the sudden loss of a power plant or transmission line. Upon a major supply loss, the Midwest ISO's control system will immediately increase the energy output of power plants, providing these reserves. Without these reserves, a loss of power plant or transmission line could result in a local power outage or even a widespread blackout. These services are so important, regulators can impose large financial penalties for failure to comply with performance standards for these services. So how is the Midwest ISO involved? By operating an ancillary services market over a large region. The market determines the most cost-efficient assets to provide these services. Furthermore, the scale of the Midwest ISO's operations allows less capacity to be used to meet these requirements on a region-wide basis. This is in comparison to the greater amount of capacity needed if each individual utility were responsible for meeting its own requirements. Creating these markets presented significant challenges. First, there was a human factor. There were lots of doubts. We heard, it can't be done. You'll never be able to take all of the data from your member systems and put it into a mathematical equation engine that will solve. And if it does solve, it will take too long, if it's accurate. Let's hear it from some of our stakeholders themselves. Well, when the process started, there were disagreements about what the goal should be. There were a number of challenges because stakeholders come from, from, from all different areas, lots of different agendas out there. Some stakeholders said, we just copy what any other RTO is doing. But doing that, we would have realized and just copied their mistakes. What really generated uh, probably the most discussion uh, was the primary technique that would be used to clear the market. So the thought was, why don't we try to make it the best we know how? And that meant pushing the envelope. It meant doing some things that other RTOs were thinking about doing and were planning to do, but weren't prepared to make the step to do it. Uh, there were a couple of choices out there. One uh, we call sequential optimization, which is kind of the technique that was uh, used by many of the other uh, RTOs and markets that had already been developed. And that was an easier technique to implement, but in the end, it does not maximize the value. And the big discussion was around what's called simultaneous co-optimization. And what is it? Uh, what's the benefits? What are the downfalls? What's the threats and challenges? What we really wanted to do was go to what we call simultaneous co-optimization, where we simultaneously optimize all the products. When we looked at all the other RTOs, it was, okay, this seems to be a new design, and it would yield tremendous benefits if done properly. Because of the uh, amount of value generated by the ancillary services market, every year that you would delay the market, uh, there are millions and millions of dollars of potential value that, uh, that you're not uh, taking advantage of. So there was a lot of pressure from stakeholders to, to get the market up and running very quickly. Uh, and there was also concern among stakeholders that if we went down the uh, path of uh, simultaneous co-optimization and it didn't work out, uh, that would not only delay the market, but there would be a lot of uh, resources and, and money spent on something that didn't work in the end. We had to be patient to allow our stakeholders to build confidence in the new business processes. This took time, determination, and patience. We needed to explain complicated operations research-based market processes to a diverse audience with varying degrees of technical expertise. Market participants needed to agree to a common set of market rules and procedures. Participants and Midwest ISO staff needed to be trained. The Midwest ISO and its stakeholders participated in many tests of the new software to verify that our and their system and processes were ready. Market participants had to update their business processes, software, and control systems. Tests allowed stakeholders to prepare their systems and gain experience interacting with the energy and ancillary service market. 
The human factor alone could have deterred us, but we also had to face significant technical challenges. No energy market system had ever been built to dispatch as many power plants and miles of transmission as in the Midwest ISO region. Could operations research techniques handle the scale and performance requirements? Just one of our optimization problems involves over 3 million continuous variables, 450,000 binary variables, and nearly 4 million constraints. I will now introduce Minglong Hong, one of the Midwest ISO's lead engineers and one of the real brains behind the project. Mingwa will explain how our engineers applied optimization techniques to meet our needs and conquer our many technical challenges. Mingwa. Thank you, Richard. I'll start with a simple example. Consider three companies that own power plants P1, P2, and P3 as well as demand centers D1, D2, and D3. Think of a demand center as a town or city that uses electricity. Before the Midwest ISO, each company operated independently and primarily relied on its own power plants to meet its demand. A company only imported energy from a neighboring company when it could not fully serve its own demand. As a result, all three power plants, P1, P2, and P3, are on all the time whether fully utilized or not. Furthermore, the cost to run P1, P2, and P3 vary greatly. P1 is cheap to run and P3 is expensive. The overall cost to the system is inefficient. These inefficiencies are paid for by customers like you and me. During the peak hour, only the two cheaper power plants, P1 and P2, are needed to serve all the load, D1, D2, and D3. P3 is not needed, and only P1, the cheapest power plant, is needed to serve the loads during the off-peak hours, usually the middle of the night when we are sleeping. How can the system operate in order to ensure that the inefficiencies in the system are minimized? This is where the Midwest ISO energy markets come in. Let's say that these three companies formed the Midwest ISO. The three companies turn over the operational control of their power plants and transmission lines to us. The three companies become market participants in our energy markets. For power plants P1, P2, and P3, the owner companies, Company 1, Company 2, and Company 3, submit supply offers that represent their production capabilities and cost. And for demand centers such as D1, D2, and D3, the owner companies, Company 1, Company 2, and Company 3 submit demand bids that represent the projected consumption quantity and they're willing to pay price. The Midwest ISO determines which power plant supply offers and demand center bids are accepted and at what price. This decision process is called market clearing. The accepted offers and bids represent an energy production and consumption schedule that incurs the least societal cost. In our simple example, market clearing ensures that the cheaper power plants, such as P1 and P2, are first called on or dispatched to serve demand during the peak hour. During off-peak hours, only P1 is dispatched. Besides running the market, the Midwest ISO also operates the, system phys uh, the physical system grid. In other words, the Midwest ISO makes sure that the energy cleared is securely delivered, meaning it does not overload the transmission lines. Of course, the real system network is much larger and more complex than this simple example. The Midwest ISO market includes more than 1,000 power plants and 57,000 miles of interconnected transmission lines. That's enough transmission line to circle the Earth over two times. Let's talk about how operations research was used in the energy-only market launched in April 2005. The market employed complex optimization algorithms that crunched through millions of variables and constraints to ensure that the most efficient power plants were running 24-7. This was done through two sequentially solved optimization algorithms. The first algorithm, the commitment algorithm, involves committing the power plants to be on or off over time. The second algorithm, the dispatch algorithm, determines power plant output levels and prices. In both problems, 
the optimizations incorporate constraints that represent the transmission system capability. In other words, the transmission facilities, such as lines and transformers, can only be asked to carry electrical flows within their physical limits. This avoids overloading and damaging expensive equipment. Solving the two optimization problems is essential to our business operations. Every day, our day ahead market accepts or rejects offers and bids by solving one on-off commitment problem. On this slide, power plants one, two, and three have been committed to provide energy for the next day. The dispatch problem produces hourly output levels in energy prices. As illustrated, these output levels match the forecasted demand for each hour. For day ahead, dispatching for the 24 hourly time periods can be solved independently once the on-off commitment problem have been determined. Besides mar the market clearing process, processes, the on-off commitment problem is solved multiple times a day for planning purposes. This is to evaluate the adequacy of online power plant capability against updated demand forecasts for different time horizons of the future. During real-time energy production and delivery, our real-time market clears offers by solving the dispatch problem every five minutes on a 24-7 basis. Every five minutes, power plants receive dispatch instructions on how much they should change their output during the next five minutes. No energy market system had ever been built to commit and dispatch the number of power plants along this much transmission line. And the Midwest ISO was the first to do this at five minute intervals instead of the accepted industry standard of every 15 minutes. A five minute interval allows the Midwest ISO to adjust more quickly than other RTOs to changes on the grid, which improves grid reliability. The scope and scale of the problem posed tremendous operations research challenges. These challenges included whether or not we would be able to solve within time. For the on-off commitment problem, the main challenge was to solve a large model with binary decision variables. Although the problem was best formulated as a mixed integer programming or MIP problem, the project team designed an optimization algorithm based on the Lagrangian relaxation method. The Lagrangian relaxation method was chosen because commercially available MIP solvers could not solve such large problems at the time. The Lagrangian relaxation method decomposes the system-wide commitment problem into many single power plant commitment problems. The single power plant commitment problems were solved multiple times until convergence toward an optimum commitment solution was achieved. For the dispatch problem, we used linear programming and built an efficient software engine to perform the solution. All decision variables in the dispatch engine are continuous. They represent power plant output levels. Two sets of output are obtained from the engine's LP solution, the primal solution and the dual solution. The primal solution represents the power plant output levels and the dual solution or shadow costs represent the energy prices. Because of transmission constraints, energy prices can vary by the plant or demand location. The market participants financially settle their offers and bids at the prices determined by this model. The greatest challenge with the dispatch, dispatch problem is achieving an optimal solution within a tight time frame, say around a minute. This provides power plants enough time to adjust their energy output before they receive the next signal. The signal is sent every five minutes. Solving the commitment and dispatch problems in 2005 was a milestone achievement for the Midwest ISO as well as for the energy industry. We relaunched the energy markets again in January 2009. This time, we included markets for ancillary services like regulation and contingency reserves. Why did we recreate the energy market with ancillary services? A cost-benefit analysis that the Midwest ISO performed served as the catalyst. Ancillary services were previously managed by 27 entities in different territories within our region. The Midwest ISO and our members knew that further efficiencies could be gained by consolidating all 27 entities under one centralized entity operated by the Midwest ISO. 
The real question was, how should we do this? And how could operations research help us again? With the ancillary services market, our goal was to minimize total production cost by scheduling both power plant output and reserves at the same time. Power plants can submit reserve offers in addition to their energy offers. The Midwest ISO designed the ancillary services markets in such a way that energy and reserve offers are cleared in a single optimization engine. Some RTOs separate their ancillary services markets from their energy market. They solve two optimization problems, one for the ancillary services and one for energy. Each problem, when separate, is smaller and easier to solve. This approach is globally suboptimal because of the interdependence of energy and reserves planning. Some other RTOs simultaneously optimize both ancillary services and energy in the same optimization engine. Their scale is significantly smaller than that of the Midwest ISO. The reality is that ancillary services and energy products are interdependent and should be optimized as one problem. When the power plant's energy output level is higher, its ability to carry reserves is less, and vice versa. Simultaneously optimizing both energy and reserves is more complex than optimizing energy alone. The number of decision variables and constraints can be several times more than the energy-only problems. In the on-off commitment problem, it adds 300% more variables and constraints. In the seven-day look-ahead commitment process, the commitment problem solution can involve as many as 3 million continuous variables, 450,000 binary variables, and 4 million constraints. Performance was our greatest concern. For the initial energy-only market, we had used a decoupled and iterative process called Lagrangian relaxation method to solve the commitment problem. This type of engine was too slow for simultaneous optimization of energy and ancillary services. Fortunately, there were advances in technology and operations research that occurred since the launch of the energy-only market in 2005. First, following Moore's law, computing technology had advanced significantly from 2005 when the energy-only markets began to 2009 when the ancillary services markets were to begin. Secondly, significant improvements had to be made to optimization algorithms due to the work in operations research, because of its now stronger modeling capability and faster convergence rates, we proposed using the mixed integer programming, or MIP, for solving the commitment problem for the energy and ancillary services markets. The project team made a prototype using MIP for a realistic Midwest ISO model in early 2007. This work showed promising results. In the next 18 months, the project team formulated and implemented the commitment problem as a MIP problem. I'll illustrate our MIP formulation for the commitment problem. These are some of the main decision variables and constraints. We do not have time to show you all of the variables and constraints now. The binary variables represent the on-off status of power plants P for each hour H, as well as the hourly starting up, shutting down, and regulating statuses. The continuous variables represent the hourly energy regula regulation reserve and continuous reserve levels of the power plants. In this example, the study period spans over 24 hours. The objective function minimizes the total production costs, which includes startup costs, no load costs, energy costs, and the operating reserve offer costs. The maximum and the minimum capacity constraints limit the energy output of a power plant. They also limit the regulation reserve and continuous reserve, uh, continuous reserve the plant can carry. Once a power plant starts up, it needs to stay online for a minimal period of time. And if a power plant shuts down, it will need to stay offline for a minimum period of time as well. Not counting regulation, the, plant, the output change of a power plant from one period to the next, it's bound by its maximum ramping capability. For each transmission line and transformer equipment, the power flow cannot exceed its capacity rating. The transmission constraints ensure 
that the energy output of the power plant won't overload the lines and equipment. On an hourly basis, the system's total energy production should balance the total demand. Both regulation reserve and continuity reserve should meet a total online procurement requirement. This is required to ensure reliability and because of federal regulations. MIP performance was our key technical concern as we integrated ancillary services with energy. We made great effort to improve the MIP performance. We will briefly highlight some of these efforts. Pre-processing reduces the number of on-off commitment decision variables. For example, physical constraints determine some commitment decisions. Some power plants commit or decommit for specified time periods. These self-commitments are pre-processed to remove them from the model as decision, as decision variables. Occasionally, conflicting inputs cause infeasibility. In this case, the optimization algorithm typically relaxes some of the constraints by formulating and solving the auxiliary problem. The Midwest ISO project team designed the commitment and dispatch optimization engines so that most infeasibilities are identified prior to the initial solution attempt. Removing these temporary infeasibilities reduces the solution time. There is usually more than one way to formulate a constraint involving binary decision variables. Certain formulations, known as strong formulations, can be solved more quickly. The Midwest ISO identified strong formulations for all major constraints that impact performance. In the case of the minimum runtime constraint, formulation one, which is the more obvious formulation, would state that if a power plant starts at time t, then it must remain operating until at least time t plus minimum runtime. A stronger and less obvious model formulation, formulation two, would state that if a power plant is not operating at time t, then there must be no startups of the plant in the previous minimum runtime number of periods and if a power plant is, is operating at time t, then the number of startups in the previous minimum runtime number of periods cannot exceed one. Experimental results showed that the stronger model formulation solved about 15% faster than the more obvious formulation. We made other strong formulations, which we do not have time to show you now. We developed model-specific cuts to reduce runtime by tightening the constraint linear region without losing the integer feasible points. For example, between two adjacent hours, change in the power plant's energy output is bound by its maximum ramping capability. If power plant P1 cannot support the system demand change between hours H and H minus one, then either one or both of plants P2 and P3 need to be committed in hour H. This observation leads to an additional constraint added to the formulation. The newly added constraint is called a cut. It tightens the feasible region, thus reducing runtime. Ames and the commercial solver CPLAX 11.0 solves the commitment MIP formulation. The Midwest ISO consulted the CPLAX solver vendor and even CPLAX creators for insights and recommendations. After intensive testing, most of the parameter setting recommendations were implemented. Before we turn this presentation back to John to discuss the Midwest ISO's value proposition, the Midwest ISO would like to thank our vendors for, um, that played a critical role in the development of our markets. Alstom Grid, Paragon Decision Technology, the Glarus Group, and Utilicast. Thank you. Back to you, John. Thank you, Minghua. To value the Midwest ISO's impact, we collaborated with our stakeholders to conduct a first-of-its-kind study to measure the value that the Midwest ISO was providing to the entire region, including all market participants and customers. If you're not convinced our members, their actions attest to the fact that the Midwest ISO is adding value. You see, membership in the Midwest ISO is voluntary. Our members are free to join and free to leave based on their assessment of the value that they receive from the Midwest ISO. Our value proposition breaks down the Midwest ISO's business model into categories of benefits and calculates a range of dollar values for each category. The Midwest ISO also provides qualitative value benefits. These benefits include price information, 
transparency, planning coordination, seams management, and the regulatory compliance functions. The more knowledge we gain about a system condition, that knowledge made possible only through operations research, the better we're able to identify additional opportunities for the efficient use of hard assets and capital investment that powers our economy. The value proposition studies conducted for 2007 through 2010 revealed that the Midwest ISO realized benefits between $2.1 and $3 billion in net cumulative savings in which operations research was a significant major driver. We also estimate that an additional 6.1 to 8.1 billion of net value will be achieved through the year 2020. The Midwest ISO's open and transparent analysis greatly increases the credibility of our value proposition. Stakeholder input is requested and received throughout the study process. In addition, stakeholder review meetings are conducted to confirm facts and assumptions. The process is open to all stakeholder groups and customers, including regulators, transmission owners, market participants, and the general public. Finally, the value proposition and its calculations, assumptions, and supporting information are available on the Midwest ISO's website. Who benefits from these savings? You and I do. They help our member utilities determine the appropriate time, place, and scope of investment in the grid. These savings potentially fuel investment in newer smart grid technologies and to further public policy for the development of greener energy, such as wind power. None of this would be possible if we didn't use operations research to excel at efficient wholesale energy markets. Thank you again for selecting us as a finalist, and we welcome your questions. Thank you very much.